On this episode of Catholic in America, we'll be discussing the removal of Bishop Strickland as ordinary of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. We'll also be talking about whether Pope Francis has an agenda to remove the traditional bishops from the Catholic Church. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome to Catholic in America. We're so uh, glad you're joining us today on a, on a, uh, a distance episode. Uh, we're all in different spots right now, but uh, myself, I'm Father Michael Mixon, Father Tom Dillon, Father Doug, good to see you all. And uh, today you, we're Mike. talking about Bishop Strickland, Bishop, Bishop Joseph Strickland and his removal by Pope Francis um, from being the ordinary, being the Bishop of Tyler, Texas, and uh, something that really sent kind of shockwaves to the church here in America and there's been lots of fallout of that, lots of discussion. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. So as, as we, uh, as we, I know this, all of us have been asked questions about this and, and Father Doug, um, you, you've been uh, kind of, you know, preparing questions for us that, that you know, of, of things that you think we should talk about. So, so what's maybe a good, a good angle that we can take on this? Yeah, I mean, um, how about we start with um, what what your thoughts was when you heard uh, the news, um, Father, Father Michael? What what was your your first uh, thoughts and feelings when you heard the news of this? I was, oh yeah, just honestly, I, I've been, I'm not an expert in Bishop Strickland. I've never met him before. Um, I know some people that have run into him. I've just kind of seen, like most people, like he, he's, he's a bishop of a small diocese in Texas. And uh, the only reason I know about him is because of Twitter and because of, of social mm -hmm. media, uh, which is you know, right. just 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 the fact of the matter. And um, he's he, he's come out very forcefully about a lot of um, the hot button cultural issues and moral issues in the church. Um, and uh, and I, I saw the things that were brewing between him and, and, and the Vatican, not so much about those, but it seemed more about kind of the way he was approaching things, the way he was questioning things done by Pope Francis. And so I was not surprised. I don't know, let, let me just sum it up. I was not super surprised, but my my first response was just to pray. I I I, um, I honestly I, I heard about it as I was about to get in the car, and I, I started driving. I said three Hail Marys for Pope Francis and for Bishop Strickland, and for all those that are impacted by this. I know a lot of people are you know the people of Tyler, Texas, most specifically, but a lot of people uh, throughout the country are struggling with it. Yeah, definitely, Father Tom. Yeah, I wasn't too surprised. Um, I've only actually, like uh, Father Michael, I've only really kind of heard, not gotten to know about uh, Bishop Strickland probably in the last two years as he's popped up multiple times on social media as well as in news news feeds. So um, when I heard about it with, with, with the understanding I have, I was not surprised. So because, um, yeah. I, I, again, there's a lot of – I was still waiting. I was hoping for more from the Vatican. I was hoping for a more clear, concise – reason from the Vatican um, for the, the removal. I was hoping for that. And I'd heard that there was rumors that was going to come out, but that we have yet to hear something clear and con, uh, precise from the Vatican on his removal. So kind of, it's, I'm, I'm still kind of wondering what was the actual cause, like the actual cause for uh, his removal. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I, I only knew about Bishop Strickland. Um, uh, I have a friend who um, is a Catholic priest ordained in his diocese, and um, I, I I knew of him um, from from that. But we we really don't talk much. <laughs> we we don't make the practice of talking about our bishops too much, and so um, <laughs> e even now we still don't. And so there's really not much of that. We just pray for each other, you know, and pray for our bishops. Um, but um, just from the things that I've been seeing on on Twitter and some of the things that some of the um, things that I've been seeing. Uh, through the media itself, and then um, some things that he had said in certain, in particular situations, and specifically um, a document that he signed um, a, a year or, or two ago. Um, I, I was the same. I wasn't really, um, I wasn't all that surprised that uh, that this would happen and that this uh, took place the way it did. I was surprised initially that something like this was happening because, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in in the history of the church, this is a more common and regular thing but for you know for us here in the united states at least for for me and in, in this century you just don't see too much of this you know yeah, what I mean? it, it reminded me of i'm sorry brother tom but it reminded me of i don't know if y'all remember last year um bishop and i had to look up the name because i, I you know just uh, bishop daniel torres from um 
Arecibo, um, Puerto Rico was was basically this is kind of the height of kind of COVID stuff and, and vaccine mandates coming out and some bishops conferences. And I think, you know, we're coming out really strongly. So there, there was a lot of like con, kind of confusing stuff with that. And Bishop Daniel Torres, who was young, he was like 57 years old at the time, um, just all of a sudden was was told was was retired, <laughs> was was right. told by the Pope that he's no longer the bishop. Um, so I, that, that that to me is the only the only kind of like precedent that I had um, yeah. from Pope Francis from an American uh, American um, context uh, in the in, in the not in not so recent yeah in the, in the recent past. So anyway, so so that and and again some of the reasons maybe seeming to kind of knock on the same doors as far as far as uh, Bishop Torres being seemingly you know a more kind of a bastion of, of a more orthodox or, or conservative kind of leaning, possibly. Again, I'm, I'm not part of that context. I'm not part of his diocese. So I don't have all, all the insights there. Right. Um, but it, it's it, it kind of, you know, it's it's the sort of thing where it, there seems to be a consistent link but between those two for, for people to make that connection pretty easily. Right, right. And, and specifically, even um, it seems like maybe some of their um, seemingly political leanings as well. I mean, it, it seemed like you had some, um, even, you know, conservative, even politically, not just, um, traditionally as well. It, it seems like that was some of it, but, but you know, I mean, this is a little unprecedented because, uh, you know, the history of the church, we haven't had this kind of media. We haven't had this kind of, um, immediate, um, you know, knowledge of things that are going on. You really hadn't, you really didn't have this kind of a platform in, in the history of the church. I mean, you just look at the change in communication in the last 500 years, and then just look at it in the last, you know, what, 20 years or so. Um, you really didn't have this kind of communication. And so, you know, this kind of skirmish, we, we might not have heard as much about. This would have probably been written more in like journals or, or, or oh, you know, history, things like that. History, history books were not even mentioned because, I mean, really, honestly, when you get down to it, at the end of the day, like um, how many how many common persons cares what's happening with the bishop of another diocese that doesn't impact them themselves? So it's very true. End, like this is this has happened tons of times throughout history. It's just like this now in our face. I, right. I do think I think that I mean the Vatican obviously has the right to uh, the Holy Father has the right to remove people from office, um, especially if there's a problem. I, I guess the difficulty that I just still have is like it's obviously a punitive measure. Um, yeah. And if it's meant to be a punitive measure, there needs to be some type of teaching within the punity. So like we know that that's maybe a, one of my kind of my criticisms of what's going on from yeah. like my perspective I'm, is like, what, what's, what is the, if, if you're going to punish someone or if you're going to do something, you like people need, if you're going to make an example of someone, then you need to give a reason so that we can learn the reason if that yeah. makes sense. But, but I, you know, I, I wasn't really surprised that there hadn't been. Matter of fact, I was more surprised to hear that, that they might reveal some of the reasons uh, simply because uh, this seems to be a, a removal from his diocese more so than a removal from ministry um, in, in general. I mean, it just seems to be that he was removed from his diocese. Um, and, and, you know, just some of the things that we've heard, even some of the things that, that um, Bishop Strickland has said is, is it seems like there was some administrative stuff that was going on in his diocese that uh, maybe people weren't happy about, happy about. maybe the, some of the priests weren't happy about. Um, we do know that there were two bishops that uh, came in and they did an apostolic visit and they suggested those sorts of things as well, that there was administratively something going on. But again, that's so vague. I mean, who knows what that is? Who even really knows you know, what that, what that even really means. And so right. I, I wasn't, I wasn't exact. I, I, matter of fact, I would be a little bit more surprised if something was released about it simply because you don't want to ruin this man's ministry as, as a, as a bishop and as a priest going forward. It, you know, if you, if you feel like, you know, I, I think the, the, what we see is, is the Vatican felt like he was unfit to be the Bishop of Tyler for whatever reason. But uh, it's obvious that they didn't want to take his ministry away from him. And so if you're going to do that, um, you know, you know, a lot of criticism of him might not be the best way to go if you if you don't want to, you know, unless you want to take him out completely out of uh, ministry. Um, it just seems to me that that you're not going to get as much said about this. But we really didn't hear much about the bishop you were talking about either, Um Father Michael. So, right. Um, right. so, so that's the reason why I, I would be very surprised if we hear um, much more out of the Vatican. I'm, I'm like you, uh, Father Tom, I've heard that people say that there was going to be something released um, so that we would have a, a little bit better understanding. I'm assuming it's going to be pretty vague. I'm assuming it's not going to be um, 
you know, well, you know, as much. So, so as far as, you know, that's, that's our thoughts and feelings uh, so far, um, you know, that we know and, and it's about um, as far as some of the things that you have seen, uh, some of the things that, that maybe was disturbing from, from either side of this, what, what, what do you, what can you say about the things that you have seen specifically the reaction that you might have from um, the, the Vatican removing him and then mm -hmm. the reasons that, that you, maybe you've seen that, that he, maybe these were the reasons why he was removed. Well, I mean, I mean, the big thing, I think most all of us have heard this and this kind of gets easily tossed around is like the, the, the Pope removed him because he's a conservative bishop. Um, I think that that's usually kind of like the narrative that's being shared. The conservative bishop is ousted by Pope Francis sort of thing, or, or that he's taking a stand against abortion or he's taking a stand against um, homosexual marriage. And, and, and uh, that's why the Pope removed him. In. But the reality is, is basically every bishop of the United States has taken publicly, privately, teaching wise, taken stands against all those issues. Now, how they've done it, you know, maybe, maybe is different. Maybe would it be the same as, uh, so anyway, so it, it is just that, that's kind of the thing that said, like, he, it's as if all the other bishops were like, oh, I'm kind of in favor of abortion. And, and Bishop Strickland was like, I'm against it. And then the Pope right. said, well, then you're out, you know, in a sense that that's kind of how people, I think, hear this when every right. single, every single year, yeah. every single bishop's conference puts out yeah. ton, you know, uh, every single, you know, a uh, uh, group of bishops, every state, um, the USCCB put out things against abortion, put out things in favor of, of you know, yeah. marriage is lifelong union between a man and a woman, put out things against all the, you know, in, in favor of all the moral teachings of the church. And so it's, in a sense, it's not that simple, you know, people kind of yeah. like, like to, sim you know, want, want a simple answer for that. You know, people yeah. in America, we want like, well, this person's a Democrat and Bishop Strickland's a Republican. And that's why, <laughs> why he got, but that's, that's not what the church, the church doesn't fall along those lines. So, but, but again, I understand the need for trying to make some sort of sense out of it because no one who makes these decisions is actually giving any clarity. Right. Well, well the USCCB I, even last week had, had made the statement that, you know, the number one issue is in the United States is still abortion. So yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean the Bishop's conference voted on that. So anyway, I'm sorry, Father Tom. No, I, was, I think that the one thing that distinguishes Bishop Strickland from other bishops, and I think this is also one of the reasons why the Vatican um, decided to do, um, remove him from office was that there's a, he's been probably one of the most outspoken advocates. Um, so he's beca he's done a lot of advocacy and outspoken advocacy, especially through social media, and has uh, and that's one of the things that my understanding is that he got um, pretty much told to get off of social media for like several years. Yeah, the Vatican constantly told him to get off social media and stop advocating and stop doing this this public this public uh, advocacy because he'd been much more outspoken as an advocate, I mean, I, I think that, like you said, I agree with you, Father Mike, that um, all, all the bishops in the United States are um, have spoken out against abortion. I mean, we're all united as a Catholic church in that, but there's a difference between those who are going to be outspoken advocates and, ad, and advocating constantly for it versus uh, bishops versus mm -hmm. others. So, but still, I think that at times, I think that's also what has gotten Bishop Strickland into trouble is his, in that he sometimes has gone too far on social media and he said things which um, he's obviously not the biggest fan of Pope Francis right. for the lack of clarity and the confusion that he's caused. But I think that that's also, from my perspective, that's a an, kind of a, a point which I would see with Bishop Strickland. He's also on social media and some of the things that he's said and done, he's also been equally unclear and hasn't been precise in some of the statements that he said. Um, so I think, yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. I, and I think so. So I think the Twitter thing has been, has been the big thing with this. Like, I've said it once. I'll say it again. I don't think any any dude with any authority over sixty five should have a Twitter account. Like, right. you know, I mean, it's, there's something about social media that's that kind of engenders this spouting off about stuff. Like, I mean, and, and I I've been trying to liken it to you know I've, you know friends, family members, parishioners who brought stuff up to me. Like, what if, for instance, if me as a pastor, I'm a pastor of a parish, the neighboring parish. Who I've got, you know, is an awesome pastor who, who is, is a great man of God. What if I was consistently critiquing the way he was leading his parish? Yeah. And I was putting that out on, on, on a social media platform saying this guy's doing it the wrong way. He's not focusing on the right things. Instead of focusing on this garbage, he's focusing on the environment. He should be focusing on, you know, 
end the death penalty, like what, whatever, the, you know, the, the, the many myriad of, of moral issues that the church takes a stand on in light of the gospel, that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing that and saying and critiquing him and saying he's wrong. Or if I was doing that to, to our bishop, who's who's my boss, just like right. Francis is, is Bishop Strickland's boss. If I was consistently saying, you know, our bishop's doing this the wrong way. Um, and now, if, if, I, if there's pastorally decisions that the bishop's making that are impacting me or my people in a way that's that's adverse to the faith, that's hurting us, then I need to, I need to bring that to him. And I, and I need to, I need to, to, to go through that. And maybe Bishop Strickland did. I, again, we're not privy to that information, but right. um, just to start kind of saying just online, like again, and I'll read the, the tweet that really, you know, this is probably the most controversial one that they've been pointing to. He says, Pope Francis is the Pope this is from Bishop Strickland. Um, but it is time for me to say that I reject his program of undermining the deposit of faith. Yeah. Again, I mean, right there, you're 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 stepping into. He he's he's not saying that. According to this, he's trying to he's trying to thread this needle of the Pope's still the Pope, but he's also undermining the positive faith, um, right. which whatever the you know, intentions he, are he, there he, has he, disastrous consequences. Yeah, um, yeah and if I can if, if I can interrupt right that, real quick, please. he he could have he could have also said in that same tweet or at least clarified, like. I, I'm upset or that the Pope's programs are undermining the faith. Right. Right. So, that, I mean, there, there is, and that's where you get sticky in terms of the, of the letter of what did he actually mean? Because right. if he's actually saying that the Pope is undermining, intentionally undermining the deposit of the faith, uh, he's basically, I mean, he's calling him, right. a, nearly caling him a heretic. You yeah. can't, I mean, you can't do that. And when you, you say, can, yeah, when you, you say, can, program, you remove, when you say, when you use that word program, it makes it sound like that that you know Pope Francis has this. I mean, he has this planned out agenda to undermine the deposit of faith. And so, I, I'm with you. Had he said programs or, or or even that wouldn't be you know sufficient. I mean, I agree. He, he really needed to explain that statement. Really, never did, and and never removed it from his Twitter. Um, and so, I, I think that was you know that is one of the things that I, I would think would cause a problem because. And there's no way the Pope can have a program of undermining the deposit of faith and, and, and you know, still remain, you know, the, the Holy Father that we know he's he's been, you know, chosen to be. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it kind of gets into um, and again, you can you can disagree with somebody's pastoral or prudential judgments uh, that, that that's that's totally fine. And. Pope Francis and all of us are, are have our are, are fallibility within that, you know, but when we talk about the deposit of faith and the Pope is, is the one who, who has, <laughs> is the, is the vicar of Christ, um, then, then to say that, that he has a program of undermining the deposit of faith, first of all, is a judgment of his, of his heart and intentions, which we're not allowed to do that anyway. We can, as, right. as you said, Father Tom, if someone's doing something, I'm saying like, look, I don't know what this person's intention behind this program or this initiative right. or this encyclical letter or this synod on synodality or this conversation on an airplane. Again, part of the, con you know, part of the, the confusion with all this is there's so many ways that we get information about what the Pope has said or done and what people around him have said or done that we, it's hard to even know, is this some, you know, where, where it, it lines up with church teaching or if he's trying to make an authoritative statement to say like, this is, it's confusing when I heard it this way. And I'm trying to reconcile this with the deposit of faith. And so how, how, do, how do we make that, you know, so in a sense to bring that question up, I think is, is a very valid question. And, 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 but to say that, that the Pope is, has a program of undermining, the, again, the deposit of faith. I don't know if that was a tweet written at 1030 PM. Um, yeah. I don't know if that, that <laughs> well, would be. I, I think that also for, for the people who are watching this, I think it's also important for us maybe to clarify what the deposit of faith, like when we say the deposit of faith, like, what do we mean by that? Yeah. Which we, is we, we, the creeds the, and councils. Like, you know, the yeah. sacred scripture, the, you know, the, the, the creed, the councils, the ecumenical councils of the church. That, that's what the deposit. Of faith yeah, the dogmas is. and the doctrines of the faith. Yeah. And if you're going to accuse, if you're going to choose, the, if you're going to accuse the Holy Father of undermining or weakening the deposit of faith, you better cross your eyes. I mean, cross, cross your T's and dot your eyes. And yeah, <laughs> <Or his laughs> otherwise, otherwise you end up, you end up doing exactly that. You end up crossing your eyes and dotting your T's. Right. But you ha you have to be very clear. Yeah very precise if you're going to accuse the holy father of that you better have all your ducks in a line and you can't just throw out these these wide sweeping statements without proof and evidence right well you, you um, need to say right. it is time for me to say that i reject like as if like you know what i'm saying it was almost kind of like oh this is this is the moment that everyone's been waiting for 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 me to to reject this officially again if you're the bishop of a diocese and, and i say this we've got a great bishop of our diocese 
He's faithful. He's orthodox. He loves the Lord. He loves the church. He teaches the hard truths of the faith with pastoral charity and love, you know, clear teachings, you know, so all, all of that. But people don't know about him and he's not making waves and people aren't like like in, in, in Milwaukee aren't saying like, you know, oh, what does Bishop Bill Walk say about this? Because it doesn't matter what Bishop Bill Walk says for somebody Correct. in Milwaukee because he's not the bishop of that diocese. So in a sense, well, there's this weird kind of and I think maybe this is part of kind of uh, just, you know, a, a, a sort of a worldwide phenomenon we're seeing where we're like kind of picking and choosing leaders that we like from other countries or other other yeah. situations or institutions yeah. and saying because of because they have a, a, an online presence, making them that's my guy. That's that's that, that's my that's my spokesperson. Yeah. And so this is a good bishop here. And the, those other ones are bad. Um yeah. And well, I, I think mean, there's that's two. Really, that, that's not what. That's not what. Why we have dioceses and bishops and everything else. So again, that's aside from Bishop Strickland, but whether or not his his actions have kind of fomented that yeah. or encouraged that, I think is something you know is, is part of the equation here. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's two unfortunate things, and they they kind of go together a little bit. But um, you know, one unfortunate thing is is that for for Strickland to make an accusation against the Pope publicly the way he did, that's a that's a very big very big problem uh, you know i mean just not even going back into councils and and what they have said but just looking at canon law itself i mean um we're not to make those kind of accusations uh, at least publicly um about a pope and so you know if he if he had issues with him i'm hoping that he took them up privately and, and that multiple bishops if they had problems with him would have taken it up privately with him and not made it so public and that's part of the problem that i think we, we're seeing right now is just the public nature of this and that is the second part of the issue and part of the problem is is because i don't care what it comes out of pope francis's mouth at this moment there is a segment of our catholic population that is taking whatever he says sometimes even things that are very clear and making them unclear there is a, there definitely is a program of undermining pope francis at this point there's i mean at least in my mind there's no question about it it could be shown from numerous podcasters and youtubers um, it can even be shown about some of these catholic news shows that that there's definitely there's definitely this thing going on to undermine Pope Francis and in, in who he is in, in his office. Um, and, and I think you, you see this because, uh, you know, and Pope Francis doesn't help himself when he makes unclear statements, so that <laughs> it can be taken in a particular way, but the, the benefit but, of the but doubt. Not, neither, neither does Bishop Strickland help himself well, that's when what he I'm makes about to say, statements. That, that we give the benefit of the doubt to Bishop Strickland and not to the Holy Father, to me, is a travesty. And so how could we not take some of these things that are unclear that, that, that Pope Francis may be saying that seem unclear to us? To me, what they need is this context, maybe, or maybe even, uh, you know, this is where I'm coming from with this. Some of it is, is, is he's speaking with all of the knowledge of the things that he's written and past popes have written in mind. And so sometimes when he's speaking, he's speaking with a certain context in mind that if you just read what he's said, or specifically the way it's pulled out of, of, of speech, where, I mean, look, we could make Bishop Strickland looked very, very bad, or any bishop or any priest for that matter, by taking one or two sentences out of a homily or out of something that they said and really make them look, you know, not very good at all because you don't have the full context to it. And especially, I mean, like if you have a, a priest who's uh, preaching a, a, a four part series in a homily and he says one thing in the third homily and you don't have the other two homilies to, you know, you didn't hear the other two. You may take something that he's saying out of a context. It's the same thing here. And, and I, you know, one of the biggest problems is, is we have, um, and, and unfortunately it's not just people who are on the extreme left. It's some of these people who are on the extreme right who are taking Every little thing, like uh, Pope Francis just re just released an apostolic letter about Freemasonry the other day, one in which I thought was abundantly clear. I, I, I didn't see any ambiguity in it at all, which is eh, a little unusual sometimes for Pope Francis, but um, there was no ambiguity in it at all. And and I heard two or three people saying that that he's still a Freemason, and you're just like, I mean, you know, I'm not so sure that there's anything Pope Francis can do right now that's going to change the narrative of some of the people who are against him at the moment. And unfortunately, those are the, the squeakiest wheels that are getting the oil. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's 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 there's a couple things that we have to kind of hold in tension here, and I, I and I say that as someone who does it very imperfectly. Um, first of all, that this is Jesus's church. Jesus founded the church. Um, Jesus does not gar- guarantee the impeccability of of the members of the church or the leaders of the church or, or even the you know his vicar, uh, you know the vicar of Christ, the Pope. Um, the successor of St. Peter, that just every decision he makes or everything he says is, is, is correct. Um, the Pope can say incorrect things and can be wrong, and, and, and that's right. Good. Also, too, we recognize and realize the Pope cannot change the deposit of faith. He cannot change, you know, the, the, the can't the teach heresy. Of, he yeah. can't teach heresy. He can't, you know, uh, to, you know, change the, the dogmas of the church. Um, he can right. he can see how can we pass how can we implement this in this this new age that we're in now that we're in an internet age again whether you know he sometimes there's gonna be missteps with that and you know just like in times past when they discovered the new world and they had to like figure out okay what does this mean now we thought Europe was was this, was everything and now we got this whole other you know these whole other continents with people living on them that it, it shifted things and there was missteps within within that. Um, the, you know, the prudential and pastoral decisions that were made there. Um, and that those things need to be pointed out and they need to be brought up and we need, we need to wrestle with them, have a difficult conversation. We'd have, we need to have those things of Paul challenging Peter as, as, as we see, um, you know, in, in, in the scriptures. Sure. Um, but there's, there's that aspect too. But then also within this, that we need to be able to, um, to, to focus on, on what we can actually like affect, you know, there's that whole kind of circle of, of concern and circle of influence sort of thing. Like if someone is the father of a family and a bishop is the father of the family of his diocese, uh, the diocese that he's the ordinary of, that's a huge responsibility. I said, as, a, as we're all pastors, so to see, as, yeah. as a pastor of parish, you have pastoral authority there. If my, if my mind and heart are constantly being taken outside of that to something else, that to me is just, it's just an unhealthy spiritual practice. And again, maybe this is something that, that, that Bishop Strickland felt that he had to do. He felt compelled by his conscience to, to comment on things that were happening with yeah. the Germans, uh, German synod of bishops or with, right. you know, what's going on in the Amazonian synod or what's going on with different parts of the country or, or different politicians. But man, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for, uh, I think if, if he was off Twitter and he was preaching the gospel with fervor and with fire and with orthodoxy, um, and in his diocese, he would still be the bishop right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty positive of that. Now that's, that, that, that doesn't say that there was a right decision to oust him at this point, or that was the perfect decision too. But, but I right. do think that that's, that, that has to be said that, uh, if we were focused on what we can actually impact, it make, it makes a huge difference and probably leads to a lot more peace. <laughs> right. Well, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not, um, yeah, I'm like you, I, I, I don't want to pass judgment on whether it was the right decision or not. I, Definitely do not know enough to, you know, I have enough knowledge of that. But, but, and, and I do think that on the other hand, uh, I think what Father Tom is saying is true is, is, you know, we'd like to have a little bit more information to know, you know, why this, you know, why the decision was being made. I, I don't think that, that um, anyone who heard this was just satisfied with, oh, okay, you just got removed, you know, um, <laughs> right yeah, on, no. on either side. I mean, it. yeah, if I, I mean, I would say, what I've heard a lot of, especially, is that Pope Francis has been heavy-handed and is abusing his authority. Um, yeah. That's some of the some of the commentaries I've heard is that he's just going after the people he doesn't like, and he's being punitive unfairly right. um, and pejoratively. But I, I think that it's also in, in, like going back to Pope Francis. Like this is the whole thing. Like we don't really know because the other question is this: like if you if you accuse the Holy Father of undermining the deposit of the faith. Right. Um, that's insubordination. Yes. Like that's very clear. Like in the military, that's, that's insubordination. And like, we are a hierarchy. We are a military structure as the Catholic church in a certain sense. And so like, that's insubordination. Like, and, and there's a time to, 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 for, for a person who is an officer to, to challenge your commanding officer. I mean, just trying to speak to uh, well, English that people can hopefully understand, but right. there's a, a point where like, if you are, if you are insubordinate, you better have, you better have a really strong case. And that's what I've not seen from Bishop Strickland. Right. I've seen a lot of, a lot of these very general statements, which I agree with like where he's coming from, like, and also, but that's one th- going back to what you were saying, Father Mike, he's not, he's not being, he wasn't thrown out of, of his diocese. He wasn't taken away from as, as administrator of his diocese because he was pro-life, no. which is, which is the narrative, right. which is this false right. narrative. It's, it's a, that's a red herring. Yeah. Um, I just, I just w- mm. wish that we had more clarity on the reason, the actual reason, 
Because, I mean, that's one of the things is like the Vatican mm-hmm. does, hasn't historically done that. They just remove. Right. And well, the same um, thing that happened with Bishop Torres last year. And again, I pray for him. He's, he's out of the spotlight. Yep. I, don't, I don't know what his situation has been since then in Puerto Rico. Um, but he hasn't been on every talk show. <laughs> right. Um, like, or going down to the, the bishop's conference and praying out front or right. things like that. So yeah. this is the entirety of what the Vatican uh, Vatican bulletin uh, on the the, um, the, ret- the removal of Bishop Strickland was. The Holy Father has removed Bishop Joseph E. Strickland from the pastoral care of the Diocese of Tyler, United States of America, and has appointed Bishop Joe Vasquez of Austin as apostolic administrator of the same diocese, rendering it sede vacante, which means empty chair. So it does not have a bishop. So that's it. There's been no other. And again, right. you can you can be upset that there's not. And that's total. I think that's totally valid, whether you're a, a member of his diocese or just a you know, concerned Catholic citizen out in the world, kind of hearing about this online or listening to this video. You can be you, you can have concern. And I, I think you have every right to be. I think it's also kind of you know part of the, the human aspect of the church is that we realize. And a lot of times there's messy um, bureaucratic things that we don't get clarity. We don't get, you know, like, you know, answers. We don't get, get things laid out, you know, uh, systematically how things happen or why things happen. And that's part of the reason you got to keep praying for the church. God's, God's still going to work through this. I, th- I, I think Bishop Strickland's called to be a saint. I think the, the you know, he's, he's uh, Pope Francis is called to be a saint. God wants us to be holy. Um, and, and hopefully we'll all be in heaven together and worshiping the same Lord. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that yeah. that's gotta be our prayer within this too. And for the people whose faith is hurt by this, my prayer too, for them is, is to recognize, look, God's, God's not worried about this situation. God's not worried. God's not anxious. God is still guiding his church through imperfect instruments. Uh, the Pope on down to every single member of the church, every single one of the baptized, um, and, he, and he's doing some beautiful things. And I think maybe we can focus on that. What are the beautiful things happening in my own parish? And I, I, you know, again, when people bring this yeah. up to me, I think I'm, I'm telling them, like, we're about to have 12 people in, in our local prison that we've been ministering to come into the church in this next year. Yeah. We've got 16 people, you know, coming in, you know, about to come to full community to be confirmed. Like, let's focus on that. Like, that, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Not to just stick our head in the sand about the troubles in the church. But when I hear about them and I'm troubled by it, okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to say an extra rosary for Bishop Strickland, for his diocese, for Pope Francis. And I'm going to focus on the people that I'm called to love, which are the people around my own family, my own parish, my own diocese, because there's enough work there. Um, and, and again, that's that's not an escapist thing for me. That, that, that to me seems the most practical way forward for a, a difficult situation where there's a lot of... Um, uh, muddiness and lack of clarity. It's practical and it and it produces uh, sanity, like you said. Because I mean, you know, I, I've I've had uh, people tell me that um, you know their aunt has left the church over this, or their um, you know they have a friend who was going uh, going to Catholic church and, and stopped going. I had uh, another person that told me that uh, they were considering coming into the Catholic church, but all this, they'll just stay where they are, where they are. It's just as messed up. I mean, you know, that that's what happens when all this becomes public. That's what happens when, when, when that insatiable attitude, you know, appetite that we have for news, for gossip, for, um, for wanting to be on the inside of things, for wanting to know as much as we can, you know, some of the, some of that can be good things, but, but, you know, but it can also create what's happening now is, and, and, you know, I have uh, me coming from Protestant, a Protestant family. I, I have, you know, family members that are like, what in the world's going on over there? You know? And mm. so it just creates, a, 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 you know, it, it's airing our dirty laundry out for everyone to see. And and that was probably the, the biggest problem I had with, with, with Bishop Strickland is, is airing our grievances out on Twitter for the whole world to see and giving people reasons to not only not join us, but to criticize us. And so that, that's reason why, you know, these are the kind of things that I think, you know, it's best if they're behind closed doors. Like you were saying, Father Michael, you know, if you had a grievance specifically from your parish, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't put it on Twitter. I mean, you would go over to, to Pittscola and talk to Bishop Bill about it. Yeah. Um, you know, that that's the kind of things. And like you said, maybe he tried that and he didn't get any satisfaction from it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough to know. I just can't justify, um, you know, airing our grievances out in, in, in public like this. Well, which, which is also, I mean, if, if you didn't go through the process, it's unbiblical because you have a problem, you go one-on-one yeah. then with a few people, then you bring it to the, to the larger. So that's the whole thing. I mean, sometimes, but in, in the whole case, like what you're also saying, 
Father Doug is also, I think is appropriate for us to remember is like, sometimes it's better than just not to know. Yep. Like we don't need to know. We don't need to know everything. Like sometimes it's better not to know. And that's why there's a certain level of prudence, like prudential guidance and prudential decision-making happens behind closed doors because not everyone has the same training, doesn't have the same understanding of things. Like there's sometimes there's private conversations and when they're blasted over social media, like it, cre- it creates a condition where scandal yeah. can, can divide. Well, and, and, um, and to go the other direction with that too, Father Tom, I think it's something we can pray for, for the Pope as well to have that, you know, to, to recognize oh, you know, the Pope needs to be able to have those conversations, you know, those difficult conversations with bishops who are disagreeing with him even publicly. Um, hopefully, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm the biggest sinner I know, you know, when, when people disagree with me with the way I'm running things in the parish, if, if I can actually have a conversation with them, you know, it's much easier just to sort of write them off and believe me, it's tempting at times, <laughs> but, but to, to instead say like, all right, can I have a conversation with this person and hear them out? And uh, that's hard to do. And so, you know, I think we can pray for all of us, but then the church to be more biblically sound in the way we deal with, with difficult uh, circumstances and situations. Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, uh, thank you guys for having this conversation uh, specifically about, um, you know, a, a situation in our church that's not uh, necessarily we, we want, you know, this to be gre- you know, this to be aired out. But it's definitely something that um, I, I feel like people in our in our audience here would have been asking questions about wanting to know. And so I'm glad we had this opportunity to sit yeah. down and kind of talk about it and at least share a little bit about it. This wasn't meant to be exhaustive in any way, shape or form, but just uh, kind of to get the ideas and, the, and kind of how we felt about it. And so, um, well, Father Michael, would you, would you close us in prayer, maybe a prayer for, uh, for, for a Pope, for Bishop Strickland and for those who are in uh, leadership in our pair, in our uh, church. Absolutely. Lord God, we, we bring us all to you in your most holy name. Jesus, it's your church. We pray for clarity. We pray for peace. We pray for we pray against the spirit of division. We pray the Holy Spirit animate our minds and hearts. We pray especially for those who are struggling in their faith because of this, um, that they might recognize that Jesus Christ is faithful to his church and he's going to continue to lead us. So they might continue to focus on him and focus on the ways he's calling them to impact the world around, around them. We ask all this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thanks for joining us on Catholic in America. We'll see you next time. Whatever the original intent for social media was, it probably wasn't this. Well, I'm sure you've seen this viral video. M M M M M to the B. Gaming week day three. This egg is the most liked Instagram picture. Hi. Impressive carrying skills, right? Okay, so tell me all about this. Wow. Yikes. See what I mean? (laughs) However, at St. Dominic Media, we found a much better way to do social. It is a joy, a pleasure to want to spend time with the Lord and with one another. If you you delight in the Lord, he would give you the desires of your heart. And so I prayed him to send me to the right church. And so he led me to the one that he established, which is the Catholic Church. So I'm sitting in my quiet space, you know, my time with God, praying for my grandchildren. Understand that the devil isn't only the enemy of our souls, he's the enemy of our human nature. And so what God has joined, he wants to rupture. <laughs> Judeo-Christian values. No, no, you, you, no, you, you, you corrected it. Judeo-Christian values. Judeo-Christian values. <laughs> Your brain corrected it. Oh, that's fantastic. Every year, we produce hundreds of dynamic, faithful Catholic videos that reach millions of people, both online and on television. At St. Dominic Media, we're doing the heavy lifting of creating good quality Catholic content, and we'd love for you to partner with us, either by visiting stdominicmedia.com and following the share link, or by using the offertory envelopes offered by your parish from OSV. Help us sow seeds far and wide as we use new media's potential for good. Together, let us invest in and grow the kingdom.